Hi everybody, this is Professor Paul Hicks. Uh, I'm talking to you again. Uh, today we're going to talk about a pretty influential philosopher, especially from the last century, uh, from a global standpoint, uh, by the name of Karl Marx. It's actually rather interesting that today is May 5th that I'm recording this, and May 5th is actually his birthday. So, happy birthday to Karl Marx. What I'm going to do is I want to talk to you about his philosophy, but I want to make sure that you keep an open mind. Um, the ideas of communism and socialism and Marxism, they get a very bad rap in American society. And I think that's because most Americans really don't understand what these terms actually mean. So Marxism is typically, from American society standpoint, and this is not true, by the way, as we'll, you'll see as you, we get into Marx, but from the American society, Marxism is supposed to be some sort of despotic, uh, tyrannical kind of government or something like that. Marx didn't believe in that, and that's not the type of philosophy that Marx actually uh, argued for. So what I'm going to, to ask of you is to keep an open mind. Try to understand that Marx is not a communist in the understanding that most of you would have. All right, But it is the foundations for which communism has been built on. There really has never been a Marxist society. There have been some attempts at socialist societies. There's democratic socialist societies. Uh, there's been some attempts at communism. Um, but they still work within a, a kind of capitalist structure, and so they were never really fully Marxist societies. Also, Marx talks about uh, that communism is not going to happen until capitalism sort of implodes on itself. And so what the um, what you might consider like Leninism or what happened in the Soviet Union um, these were not exactly Marxism because the capitalism hasn't had the opportunity to play itself out and for us to develop into communism. That's what Marx thought. All right, so um, let me go ahead and just give you a little history of Marx. He was born in 1818, 19th century philosopher. He died in 1883. Um, he was born in the German Rhineland. His family was upper middle class. They were ethnically Jewish. Uh, his father, they weren't religious, really, by any means. They, they, they were not the type of people to pray or, or something like that. Uh, his father converts to Christianity when Marx was a child, but they didn't do that for some sort of great awakening of some spiritual awakening. No, they did that because there were a lot of anti-Jewish laws going around Europe at that time, and it was easier for them to live. Um, Marx receives his PhD at the age of 23. His dissertation is on the pre-Socratic philosophers of Democritus and Epicurus. He was a member of a group called the Young Hegelians, and this is important because this is uh, named after the philosopher Hegel, and Hegel will play a very important role in the development of Marxist theories, and it's from Hegel that if we didn't have Hegel, we would never have had Marx as, uh, as we can understand them. Um, now, he gets his Ph.D., but he's not able to find a job. He wants to have a professorship and, you know, become a professor at a university and teach. But the problem is, is he has a lot of uh, ties to very radical groups, these groups which are frowned upon by society. And as such, um, because of his views and because of his ties, nobody wanted to touch him, and he wasn't able to find a job. Well, what happens then? Well, this forces him to become a journalist um, with interest in political science and economics. Now, this move to journalism forces Marx to study more political and social issues. And it is from this that we begin to develop, or, sorry, that he begins to develop many of the writings that we read today. Um, in 1843, his newspaper was shut down, and this forces him to move to Paris where he intensifies his writing and attacks on capitalism and develops a following of working class people in Germany and France. He's forced out of France in 1845 where he moves to Brussels and this is important as well because in his move to Brussels he meets a man by the name of Frederick Engels. Engels writes uh, many of what we understand Marx's philosophy to be. Marx and Engels write a lot of it together uh, so, you know, Engels is, is pretty much just as important, though Marx is really, I think, truly the philosopher behind their actual writings. So, let's talk about Engels for a bit. Engels was from a wealthy family. He was born uh, just north in, of Marx and Barman. His family owned an international textile manufacturing business. 
Uh, Engels worked in his family business where he becomes revolted by the treatment of workers. He sees how, how his company is treating the workers and the conditions that the workers have to live in and the conditions that the workers have to work in, and he becomes disgusted by this. Engels, like Marx, he begins reading the philosopher Hegel. And just like Marx, he follows much of the same path. Well, the two of them became very close friends, and they remained so all of their lives. They write many of the important Marxist works together. And Engels does something else, because Engels had money, right? He came from a family with money. Marx didn't have any money, and he kept getting fired. And people were not very nice to Marx, right? He couldn't find a professorship. Uh, he tries writing for newspapers. They get shut down. Nobody wanted to help Marx get a job. Well, what Engels did is Engels helped support Marx. Right? Engels helps support Marx, and Marx continues to write, and he continues to publish. Um, he Marx supports himself for the most part as a freelance journalist outside of what Engels gives him, but he never actually makes much, and Karl Marx was really impoverished all of his life. So let's talk a little bit um, about capitalism. So the idea of capitalism is that people should make money, um, that people have a right to what's called private property. We saw this with John Locke and in his Natural Law Theory in the Second Treatise of Government, that private property is actually a good thing. And for Locke, the government was supposed to protect private property. Um, this is important for capitalism because, you know, private property is saying, like, if I own a factory or if I own a farm or I own um, a bunch of real estate and rent out houses or something like that. That is capital. That is money that is used or this property which is used for me to make money. And how is it that I actually make money? Well, say if I'm a real estate person, then I, I collect rents. If I'm some sort of landlord or if I'm a factory owner, maybe I'm making, let's say, some widgets. You know, I uh, have a factory composed of workers doing the labor to make widgets, and then I take those widgets and sell them, right? That's what capitalism is, because uh, from the factory owner's standpoint, they paid the workers for those widgets by the worker selling their labor. All right, so there's going to be um, two critiques of capitalism that we're going to discuss with Karl Marx. We're going to talk about the Manifesto of the Communist Party, and we're going to talk about the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. All right, so before we get into the Communist Manifesto, keep in mind um, how the Communist Manifesto comes about. Yes, it's written by Marx and Engels, and so it is Marxist philosophy. But at the same time, Marx was not writing this for other philosophers. Uh, there was a movement that was going on through Europe where people and laborers were starting to unionize, and there was a threat of communism. And this communism was a real threat to the capitalist power structure of all of Europe. Like the idea that a society should be focused on those, on the majority, that is, those who are the workers, um, was really shocking uh, to these people. And so. What happened, though, is nobody really had any sort of idea what communism really was about, what the movement was about, what are the demands of the movement. And so what happened was Marx and Engels were to write the Communist Manifesto as a way of giving a voice to this particular movement, right? So keep that in mind uh, when we're talking about that. Um, all right. So he starts off, and this is a pretty famous line in the manifesto, a specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. A specter is a ghost, for those that don't know. Uh, this has brought together the ruling parties of Europe, including the religious parties, such as the Pope. Uh, people charge their opponents, saying that you are communist. And when they say that, they don't say that in a good way. They're not saying that communism is good. They're saying if you're a communist, it's immediately understand that you're a horrible, mean, awful human being. Um, well, what follows from this? The fact that uh, the European leadership and the powerful of Europe are getting together to try to smash this movement. 
Well, two things follow from this according to Karl Marx. Communism is already acknowledged by all the European powers to be itself a power. That something's actually happening. And second, that it is high time that communists should openly, in the face of the whole world, publish their views, their aims, their tendencies, and meet this nursery tale of the specter of communism with a manifesto of the party itself. And this is essentially what it is. So let's understand something here. Um, you need to look at history in order to understand Marx. Marx, much like Hegel, he gets this from Hegel, as ideas are evolving through history. Um, and you can see this as the structures of society itself. So let's look at the history of society and how it's been structured. Well, in ancient times, you had free men and you had slaves, right? And then in Roman times, you get the patrician versus the plebeian. You get the lord versus the serf, the guildmaster versus the journeyman. In other words, you have one group of people which are in power and one group of people which doesn't have power at all. And what happens is you get the one group of people with power oppressing the group without power. So you have an oppressing group and you have an oppressed group. Early epics have always found arrangement of society such that there is this sort of gradation of social ranks. Marx brings up Rome here. Uh, there's the patrician, the knights, the plebeians, the slaves. So you had a bunch of different classes. The Middle Ages brought us the feudal lords, the, the guild masters, and journeymen, apprentices, and serfs. And of course, within all of these individual classes, there was even more gradation. The point here is that in different epics, society has been structured differently. And this suggests that our modern society is not natural. Because if it was natural, as say like somebody like John Locke argues, we would expect for societies to be the same, but in fact they're not. Right? Different times at different places, you have different societies. So it's not deriving out of something natural. Rather, we are uh, created within the material world that we understand ourselves uh, to be in. So we've had these other epics. So, so what epic are we in now? Marx says that we are in the epic of the bourgeoisie. And this derives out of the feudal society, out of the ruins of feudal society, but it did keep the class antagonisms. That is, um, it created new classes and new conditions of oppression, but it still kept one group in power and one group out of power, and that one group was oppressing and one group was oppressed. So for Marx, what you see under capitalism is you see two groups. You have the bourgeoisie, that is the capitalist class. These are the people that own houses and rent them out. They're the landlords. These are the people that own the factories, the people that own the farms. In other words, everything which is produced, they own the means of what is produced. And those means, of uh, they own the means of production. Those means are their factories or their farms or whatever they actually own. That is considered private property. And we're supposed to respect private property. Marx is going to challenge this idea, so pay attention. All right, so let's just take a look how the bourgeoisie um, was created. So you have the bourgeoisie, that is the capitalist class, and you have the what he calls the proletariat, that is the wage earners, and whose material value is really in their labor. They don't own anything. In order for them to get paid, they have to labor, they have to work. All right. So let's look at the history of this. So let's look at the growth of markets and how we came to the society that you know, Marx found himself in. So if you look at the discovery of America and the rounding of the Cape, this opened up brand new markets for the bourgeoisie. Now, the bourgeoisie, they were able to take whatever they made and produced and now trade it with other countries, people like India, China, um, you know, America, the colonies, right? They were all became trade partners. This created changes in commerce, navigation, and the means of exchange. This also created a rapid development from feudal society. Markets had to keep growing, and the demand for the goods to take to market rose. Well, this then gave rise to a machinery uh, revolution. It created large manufacturers and a class of industrial millionaires, that is the modern bourgeois, and with the rise of the world market came an increase of capital for the bourgeoisie. 
they kept making more and more and more money. So they open up markets, they sell their products in markets, they make even more money. Um, and they become even more and more powerful. So as the development of technology happens, so for example, the railways, new navigation was created, new markets were open, and people were able to sell their products even further. This creates, of course, more capital and creates more power for the bourgeoisie. This also flattened the class structure that was handed down from the Middle Ages. So what we will see is the modern bourgeoisie is actually a product of a long course of development. And it's created by a series of revolutions in the modes of production of goods and services and the exchange value of that. So the development of the bourgeoisie created a corresponding political advance in that class. As the bourgeoisie gained more capital, they controlled production, they opened up markets, they found that they now had political power. And in the modern state, they have an exclusive political sway. That is, rich people and the members of the bourgeoisie really run our society. All right? They run our society. Um, such that even the president, for example, in our country, is considered really just to be an executive to run the, the state of affairs for the bourgeoisie. There's a famous quote that Marx actually gets where he says, the executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. So let's think about what that means. As the bourgeoisie gained more and more capital, they opened up more markets, gained more capital, made more money, and now we live in a system which is monetary, that is, it is money-based. And the people that have the power are those that have the money, that is, the bourgeoisie. And so what happened then is the private interest then married the political interest, and the politics uh, and the political leaders and the bourgeoisie uh, join. And so what the state is now for is to protect private property and to protect the bourgeoisie. Think about that, um, say, today, right? Do you see that in today's world? Do you see today where rich people have more powerful uh, allies in political government than poor people? That rich people have a better life than poor people? That rich people have control and freedoms and liberties that poor people simply do not have? Um, and think about how it, this is ran. So the state is there to protect the private property, right? This is John Locke, and this is what the American Constitution is all about as well. Um, so, uh, so right now, you know, we might be going into a recession, right? We talk about whether the economy is good or the economy is bad. Well, what do we use as some sort of way of seeing whether the economy is good or bad? Well, often people refer to the stock market. Well, this is a problem because who has money in the stock market? Rich people. Poor people don't have money in the stock market. Rich people do. So when the stock market is good, it tells you how well rich people are doing. And when the stock market is bad, you can tell that rich people are just a little bit less rich. So that doesn't really help us. But when we focus all of our energies on understanding the economy from a perspective of when the bourgeoisie is doing well or when the bourgeoisie is doing poorly, what about the rest of us? So this is, we're left out of that. And so what you see, I would argue, in the in contemporary United States is just like what Marx says, that they are, bourgeoisie is in charge of our government. They pay and they buy off Congress people and they buy off politicians. Um, wherever, okay, so kind of going back here to Marx, so wherever the bourgeoisie gained power, they put an end to any sort of political systems there. Um, and this idea of self-interest becomes really important because we are seeing under capitalism that if we just seek our self-interest, everybody, things will just work out fine and everybody will, you know, find ways to make it through society and make it through wealth. Um, but this is wrong. What's happened is that it has made a person's worth, what what capitalism does is that it values the laborer uh, and for the labor that they produce as if their life has some sort of exchange value. So, for example, if you're making, say, $20 an hour, then 
from the societal standpoint, your life really is only worth $20 an hour because you'll never get that hour back. And so the bourgeoisie is buying that time in your labor. All right. Um, every occupation now has been reduced to being laborers, whether it's a lawyer or a priest or a poet, a doctor, a scientist. Relationships have become money relationships. All relationships become money relationships. All right, well, the bourgeoisie cannot exist without constantly revolutionizing the instruments of production. Now, this in turn changes the whole relations of society because it changes the relations of production. So when you're constantly revolutionizing production, it keeps changing social relations. So, for example, as um, technology increases and the way that production is, is done, so say maybe uh, robots, so for example, you know, maybe when Ford started building cards, let's say building the Model T, he had a lot of workers. But now those workers are being replaced by robots, right? They're being replaced by machines. Well, that also changes the social relations that we have. Everything that people have held to be important begins to go away. And it's all replaced by money relationships. Prejudices and opinions once held are now swept away. New opinions become antiquated before they even take hold. Marx says, quote, all that is solid melts into air, all that is holy is profane, and man is at last compelled to face with sober senses his real conditions of life and his relations with his kind. So the bourgeoisie, in order to stay in power, they have to keep creating new markets and selling more goods. And so what will happen under capitalism is there will become trade all around the globe because they have to keep opening up new markets and keep selling their goods. Um, and it gives a familiar character when this happens because remember, you know, capitalism begins to shape the society that is capitalist to be money relationships. So the United States, for example, is clearly a capitalist society. And everything here is about money and money relationships. Well, what happens when you open up new markets and go to new countries, the culture that that country had, that now begins to go away, according to Marx. And the capitalist culture is going to take hold and it's going to become a money society as well. You can be, just think about um, if you've ever traveled outside the United States, um, you could find, say, Coca-Cola. You can find Coca-Cola everywhere, right? Even though that it was an American product that was founded in Atlanta, Georgia, right, many years ago. So capitalists are creating these new markets because they have to survive. They therefore then create new desires in the population so that their products can be sold to fulfill these desires, even in the most remotest places. So rather than have a local community, what capitalism does is that it creates a universal market and therefore an interdependence upon nations. So think about it now. If, say, the United States has a recession, well, that's going to affect Europe, which will affect Asia, which, right? And will begin to affect all, everybody. We're all interconnected now. And this is because of capitalism, because capitalism has become global. And that when one part of it starts to fail, it affects another part of it. Um, right? This creates rapid improvements of all instruments of production and also control of communication. Uh, so you can think any sort of media here. And it, it develops all those, when they open the new markets, it creates these societies which now must become capitalist societies. And what we would call, from a Western point of view, civilization. It offers cheap prices. It breaks down national walls in favor of global capitalism because now we all have to work with each other. We have to work with some sort of trade. It compels all nations on the pain of extinction to ad adopt the bourgeois mode of production. That is, that the bourgeoisie should hold all power. It compels them to introduce what we call civilization or to be more like ourselves. So you can see this in contemporary times. 
um, where people are arguing that we should bring democracy to other countries, for example. Well, why do you want to have democracy? So we can bring in capitalism. That's why. And so these are just pushes for rich people to be able to make more and more and more money. Um, capitalism has changed production so much that when it used to be that people lived in rural areas, nowadays they move from the rural area and they come into these enormous cities, which then increases urban population as opposed to the rural, and it creates all the major cities that we understand today. Um, you know, so what happens is then as people move to the cities, they fill the factories, and what's going to happen? The laborers now become workers of the factories, creating more product, and the owner of the factory is getting more and more money. They are making more money, right? So what the necessary consequence of this, Marx says, is concentrated and centralized political power. No longer are states independent, but they become lumped together into nations. Think of the United States, right? Just the concept of that, the United States. There are 50 individual states, but now we are united into one nation and for one cause. You can look at this with the European Union as well. The exact same thing. You had you know, different countries all joining up into a union. Why? Because they're capitalist societies and they need to be able to have bargaining power and more political power. And that means they must have more monetary power. All right, so that's the bourgeoisie. Let's talk about the proletarians, the proletariat itself. So the proletariat is really just the working class. Uh, as capital is developed, so does the working class. Right? You can't have the rich people unless you have a working class which is working to support them. Now, the members of the working class, these are people who live only so long as they find work, right? and who find work only so long as their labor can increase capital. So in other words, if I'm a member of the proletariat, I have to work in order to make money because if not, I can't survive. We live in a society where we must work because that's the conditions that we find ourselves in. Um, so what I have to do is I have to find some rich person who I can make money and then in doing so, they will pay me for my labor, right? So we, the laborers end up selling themselves as commodities, like every other article of commerce, are exposed to the fluctuations of the market. Think about how recessions bring about unemployment, right? So the economy goes up and the economy goes down. Notice who is doing fine. The bourgeoisie does fine. Rich people don't do fine and they can you know, survive these types of ups and downs and these recessions. But poor people are not, right? What happens when, poor, when there is a recession? Poor people lose their jobs and they lose the ability to, to um, pay for their way of living. Um, here's an interesting quote from Marx. He says, the worker becomes an appendage of the machine and it is only the simplest, most monotonous, and most easily acquired knack that is required of him. Hence, the cost of production of a workman is restricted almost entirely to the means of subsistence that he requires for his maintenance and for the propagation of the race. But the price of a commodity, and therefore also of labor, is equal to its cost of production. Therefore, in proportion, as the repulsiveness of the work increases, in the same proportion the burden of toil also increases, whether by prolonging the working hours, or by increasing the work exacted in a given time, or by increased speed of machinery. So, what we have found is that as people move from the rural areas into the cities, um, modern industry really begins to take off. And the little workshops that we had, the little mom and top pop businesses, they go out a business in favor of the much larger factory. You can see this with today with Walmart, for example. Anytime Walmart moves into a city, all the mom and pop businesses go out because everybody just goes to Walmart because they're so much bigger and they're so much cheaper, right? Um, and that's really what happens in the workplace, right? Is that the modern industry gets rid of the mom and pops and it all becomes consolidated, which then gives more power to that particular factory owners or the titans of industry, we might call them. Um, so you get, what do we find now? At least during Marx's time, is you found masses of laborers 
crowded into factories. Um, you're organizing them like soldiers. Uh, he called them that they were like just privates of an industrial army. Um, the worker becomes a slave now to the bourgeois class and then over to the bourgeois state. And they are daily and hourly enslaved by the machine by what he calls the overlooker. You can think of this as, say, your, your supervisor at work. And above all, the manufacturer himself. And the more openly this despotism gains its end, the more petty, the more hateful, the more embittering it is. If you could think about it, you know, for those of you that have jobs, you hate having your boss look over your shoulder all the time, don't you? I mean, uh, don't you find that it starts to build resentment against them? And notice what happens. You start to become distant from them. You're not bringing yourself together in the relationship with your boss. What's happening is you start to despise them, right? You start to resent them. All right. So why does the laborer do this? Well, the labor puts up with this because they need money. All right, so now the laborer, the member of the proletariat, they get their cash wages, and then what do they do with their money? Well, it goes to bills, doesn't it? Just as it does now. You have to pay rent, and just think about something here for just a moment. You have to pay rent. Who are you paying rent to? You're paying rent to the property owner who is, by definition, a member of the bourgeoisie. Uh, you go buy food at a grocery store, and you make them money, right? And the owner of the grocery store owns that means of production and is a member of the bourgeoisie. And so as you pay off all your bills, what you're going to find is that, yes, the worker makes money, but all of the money goes back to the bourgeoisie through rent or through uh, payments for goods and services. Um so those who were, at the time, small tradespeople, shopkeepers, retired tradesmen, they're gradually going to fall into the proletariat because this is because um, their small amount of capital can never compete with big money from the bourgeoisie. So every society, Marx says, has been based on this antagonism of oppressing and oppressed classes. The modern laborer, instead of rising with the progress of industry, then sinks deeper and deeper below the conditions of existence of his own class. He becomes a pauper. And pauperism develops more rapidly than the population and wealth. This is why the bourgeoisie, according to Marx, is unfit any longer to be the ruling class of society. They can no longer impose its conditions of existence upon society as some sort of overriding law. The bourgeoisie are unfit because it cannot assure an existence to its slave within its slavery. Society can no longer live under the bourgeoisie. In, in other words, its existence is no longer compatible with society. This is what Marx uh, believes. All right, so um, that's the history of, of classes and oppression according to Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. So I want to talk a little bit about some other problems of, of capitalism, in particular alienation and the estrangement that we have as laborers and workers under capitalism. You know, people see capitalism everywhere in a capitalist society. They look around the world, they see capitalism everywhere, and you begin to think that this is natural, right? John Locke clearly thought of capitalism deriving out of some sort of natural system. Uh, but just because it's ubiquitous, just because it's everywhere, it doesn't make it natural. Um, what even he, he criticizes economists here because they just presuppose that capitalism has to exist and then they go and study economics within capitalism rather than challenging why capitalism even exists at all. Why should we have a capitalist system? Why shouldn't we change uh, the society that we live in? All right. Um, Political economy only tells us how things work within the system, but it doesn't tell us why we have the system at all, right? This is his his um, his 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 way of understanding economists, right? What we need is to say why do we have the system? Why we need an argument for why capitalism is a good thing? Why is a monetary system a good thing? Why is this the best system? 
Is it just because this is the system which is in place? Um, yeah, Marx argues theology does the exact same thing, is that it explains evil by the fall of man as if it's some sort of historical event. But it assumes that to be a fact. You can't use, right, the problem is you, you can't use your religious beliefs to justify your religious beliefs. Do you understand? All right, so when we talked about, say, fallacies earlier, we talked about circular reasoning. Um, and, you know, uh, you can't say something along the lines of, you know, the Bible expires, it was inspired by God, the Bible says God exists, therefore God exists. Look, you're only saying or making those statements true within the context of the religion, but it doesn't justify the religion itself. All right, so let's question the assumptions of private property. Let's question the assumptions of... Um, the way society is structured. Let's question whether capitalism actually is a good thing. So, under capitalism, there are two classes. Remember, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. You can understand that as those that own property and those that do not own property. You have the property owners and property less workers. Political economy states that there is, in fact, private property, but it never tells us why we have private property. It just takes for granted what it's actually supposed to explain. So here's a nice interesting quote I think from Marx. He says the only wheels which political economy sets in motion are greed and the war amongst the greedy. Competition. We proceed from an economic fact of the present. The worker is the one who creates wealth and by doing so they become poor. The more wealth the worker creates the poorer the worker actually becomes. How is this happening? Why does he say this? Well, let's just take an example here. Say somebody owns a factory and they make widgets, right? So what happens here? The labor produces the widget, right? The factory employees are actually the one literally making the widget. And it produces it for a value for the labor itself. That is, the wages that the worker actually is making. So the worker, say they're making $20 an hour, um, the worker becomes a commodity. They're selling their labor to the factory owner. They are a resource. Think about this in modern times. Uh, most companies have what they call a human resources department. Just think of what that phrase means, human resource. A resource is something that you can use. A resource is not something that you care about. It's not something that has interest. A resource is just something that you use and abuse. Right? You can use it. And so Marx has this idea that the um, uh, current oppressors, the bourgeoisie, the factory owners, they are using and abusing the workers. They are paying the workers less than what their work is really valued. Uh, the product is created, so they make the widget. Well, it's independent to the laborer who produced it because they don't get to keep the widget, right? If you work in a factory that produces widgets, the factory owner takes the widget so they can go sell it at the market. And so what Marx says is that we become alienated from the product that we actually made as workers, even though the worker is actually bonded to the object. The monetary value of the worker is dependent on the value of the object that he creates. So... Um, you can't pay me, you know, a hundred dollars per widget if a widget's only worth fifty bucks, right? That's not going to work. But here's another problem. So the worker creates the object, the widget, but the widget's not his. It becomes the property of the owner, and he becomes estranged from it. The worker is now alienated from which gives him, as in his labor, value. The worker is related to the product of his labor, but that object becomes alien to him. His life now becomes his labor, which creates something he does not own, and as a result, he creates a world which he has no part in. According to Marx, the laborer is not paid the true value of the labor. Right? The owner has to exploit the laborer. This is because the owner needs to keep the widget and make a profit. The product of your labor, therefore, has to be of greater value than what you're going to be paid for. Right? Do you understand? So if you, um, if it costs, say, $10 to, 
to make a widget, then the factory owner has to sell it for more than $10. So let's say a widget's worth $20 on the marketplace, but you're only paying me $10 to make it. Then you paid me $10 and you kept the extra $10 as profit. My The value of my labor was for the value of the entire uh, product, which was a $20. And so if you only paid me $10, you ripped me off an extra $10. All right? And why do we allow that? Because we're in a society where the bourgeoisie has the power. They're the ones that keep all the, all the product. They own the means of production. And the proletariat has no power. That is, it's exploitation. The rich people are exploiting poor people to make the rich people even richer. But in doing so, they concentrate the rich people to become richer. Well, that means the poor people have to become poor. Um, all right. So we have certain estrangements or what Marx calls alienation. We become The worker becomes alienated from their actual product that they have. Well, the labor, though, why do we do this? Because it produces what, we, what Marx calls the means of life. That is the means for the physical subsistence of the worker himself. That is your ability to survive in a capitalist society and pay your bills and eat and have medical care and you know, be able to survive. Um, it, our political economy requires that man works for his subsistence as a physical object. Man is now forced to make himself into a commodity. He is forced to make himself into something which produces. He is himself an object which becomes owned by the property owners. His very existence is dependent upon the labor. Not labor for which he gets the benefit, but rather labor for which the owner gets the benefit. Remember, who's becoming rich here? The owner's becoming richer and richer and richer. So now man views his labor as a mere means to get wages, which are used to create a subsistent living. The purpose of labor is then not for the production of goods he gets, but as a mere means of survival. The man focuses not on what he does, but rather on the wages themselves. Marx says, look, we could prove this. this well, you could see this as an absolute fact. He says that as soon as no physical or other compulsion exists, labor is shunned like the plague. Right? You would not go into your job unless they paid you to do it. Very few people have jobs that they would do for free. In order for people to, for you to do your job, you have to get money. You have to get something out of it. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Well, you also become alienated, uh, Mark says, from your species being. So you have to think of um, man as a, as a, as a species. Right? This, he says, is actually deduced from the first two. Man sees himself as more than just physical stuff, don't we? You're, I mean, when you like, introspect into yourself, what kind of being are you? Are you just this physical you know, robot or automaton or something like that? Are you more than that? Are you a spirit or a soul or something, right? There's something behind the physical stuff. You see yourself, he says, as an actual living being because you treat yourself as a universal and therefore free being. So you can now look at a human being into two ways. And two, all right, you can look at a human being as being the animal because we are animals. Um, this just consists in physically the fact that man is a physical being with physical needs. And then we, what we call the person or what Marx calls the man, um, that is the spiritual, inorganic nature. That is your, your mind, your, your experiences, your ability to understand what it's like to be you. Right? And this is just as important, he says, as the animal part. You know, working gives life a purpose. It's what makes a man human, is that we take stuff from nature and use it for some sort of purpose. Other animals don't do this. Other animals aren't building factories. We are, right? We, it, it gives us some sort of meaning. If a man doesn't own his labor, then man doesn't own his life's activity. Do you understand? If a man doesn't own his labor, the man doesn't own his life's activity. Because what is your life's activity? Even now, in, say, American capitalism, we have a 40-hour work week. Keep in mind, when Marx was writing, 70, 80 hours a week was, was normal. And so people spent their entire lives working. 
making somebody money just so that they can survive, right? And so human beings, these workers, they don't own their lives. They're slaves to the bourgeoisie. Um, so what ends up happening when this happens is that man no longer takes the species as an object, but instead takes the individual as the object. So that the individual becomes the purposeful life and now man becomes estranged from the species themselves. So, let's think this through. Man is alienated from his object of labor. Man is alienated from his labor because labor becomes a mean to wages. And then man becomes alienated from his species being. Well, those three lead to a fourth alienation. That is the estrangement of man from man. This is not just a separation from how man stands in relation to himself. It is also a separation in how man stands in relation to other men. The product of labor does not belong to the worker. Remember that. It belongs to the owner. The, so it's alien to man. The activity also belongs to the owner. Therefore, the labor belongs to another man who is not himself. Well, you're going to, man's going to realize this. And once they realize that his labor belongs to somebody else, he begins to despise it. The fact is, is we all hate work. Nobody likes to go to work. Everybody hates Mondays. Why do you hate Monday? It's the first day of work, right? He realizes his labor and life activity is owned by somebody else, and hence he realizes he is dominated by other men, and hence he is a slave. Therefore, man is estranged from his labor product, himself, his species, and other men. We have lost essential humanity because of a system which exploited labor for the protection of private property and capital. All right. Well, what do we do about this? I mean, if we're not going to have a capitalist society, what is it that these communists really want? Well, in the end of the Communist Manifesto, Marx lays this out. He lays out 10 conditions that would generally be applicable to any society. Number one, we must and write this down. Number one, the abolition of property in land and application of all rents of land to public purposes. You understand? No more paying rent. And if you do pay rent, it doesn't go to profit and to the owner. It goes to the public good. We should have immediately a heavy progressive or graduated income tax. Rich people need to be taxed, and they don't need to be taxed a small amount. They shouldn't be taxed at the same rate poor people are. They should be taxed very, very heavily. We should abolish all rights to inheritance. You don't get to leave your money to the next generation so that they can build even more capital. Think of, say, current billionaires now, somebody like Donald Trump, for example. Donald Trump you know, inherited $450 million dollars. How did he become so rich and successful? Well, I'm willing to bet a lot of us could have been if we were given $400 million. Um, you want to, they say, to confiscate, another is to confiscate the property of anybody that leaves the country. Co confiscate all property from rebels. We want to centralize credit in the hands of the state. We need to create a national bank with state capital that has an exclusive monopoly. No more private banks. Banking should be done for the good of the people, not for the profits of the wealthy. We should have centralizations of the means of communication and transport in the hands of the state. The railways should not be privately owned. They should be publicly owned for the benefit of the public, not for the benefit of the few rich people. The media should be owned by the government, by the state, for the benefit of the people, not for uh, to enrich the powerful and the wealthy. Why is this important? Well, I, I think if you look at the media, for example, today, uh, you have a really kind of like polar opposite. So just think about two cable channels right now. You have Fox News, which is on the extreme right wing, and you have MSNBC, which is the extreme left wing. And so what happens is people that only watch, say, Fox News, they only get information from a right wing perspective. Well, likewise, the people that only watch MSNBC, they only get 
news and media from a left-wing perspective. That is, they are trapped in a bubble. They're not getting a well-rounded understanding of what's happening in the world. What we need is for a news organization to produce news and not to produce biases in the news. And so that would happen if we had it for the good of the state rather than for uh, private means. Uh, seven, we need an extension of factories and instruments of production owned by the state to bring into cultivation of wastelands the improvement of the soil generally in accordance with the common plan. So no longer are factory owners owners. They lose it. All means of production are going to be fall under the state. Um, there is to be an equal liability of all to work. Think about that. Rich people need to get out of their limos. They need to get out of their, you know, Lear jets and actually get their hands dirty and get to work. Everybody has to work, period. Why? Uh, it's only fair, and everybody needs to do their part. Um, and there should be a combination of agriculture with manufacturing industries. We should have an abolition of all the distinction between town and country by a more equitable distribution of the populace over the country. Um, we should have free education for all children in public schools. We need to abolish children's factory labor in its present form and combine education with industrial production. This is kind of the communist view of society. Everybody works, everybody does their part. Well, what do you get in return? You don't have to pay rent, you get health care, you get food, everything's paid for and everything's taken care of for you. No longer will there be homeless people. Uh, no longer will there be poor people. There won't be rich people, but there won't be poor people. And this is the view that the communist is actually, uh, is, is the world that the communist is trying to get to. In a world where everybody works together for the benefit of all, not to where we work and sell our labor for the benefit of the few. All right, so that's Karl Marx um, in a nutshell. I, I want you to think about him uh, very seriously and, and, and don't allow any prejudices to get in the way, all right? Think about what Marx is actually saying. Don't think about what other people say Marx is saying. Read Marx for yourself. All right, everybody. I'll talk to you later. Bye.